Okay, good, very, very good morning to you all, and you're very welcome to today's Signpost webinar. I hope you're keeping safe and well wherever you are joining us from today. Uh, my name is Mark Gibson, and I'm manager of the Chagas Connected program. The Signpost webinar series has been brought to you in association with Dairy Sustainability Ireland, the National Rural Network, and Food Drink Ireland Skillnet. Today, we continue our focus on the work being carried out by the Agricultural Catchments Programme, and I'm delighted to be joined by Dr. Michelle McCormack, economist with the Catchments Programme. And today, Michelle is going to be talking to us about the economics of catchment management, linking science and farmer behaviour in the Agricultural Catchments Programme. So, Michelle, you're very welcome to our webinar today. How are you today? Good morning, Mark. I'm good, thanks. I'm good. We have a very nice sunny morning here in Portumna in County Galway, so yeah, and all it's good. Looking, looking good here. Slightly north yeah. of you here in uh, in Valley Glunan. Pass. Good morning to you. How are you today? Good morning. Great. Not a bother. All good down in Wexford. I hope. Excellent. Great. Great. So, Michelle, you've been working with the Catchins program for a number of years as economist. Can you tell us a little bit about the work that you are doing there? Um, yes, yeah, so I um, took over from Carla, Buck Carla Buckley, who's my predecessor on the Catchments program, and I suppose um, where we fit in in the Catchments program is we, we link um, what's going on on the science side with what's going on on the ground with the farmer behaviour and farm practices, and so it's kind of to give you a, a whole picture, an overall picture of what's going on in, in catchment management. Great, okay, so today you're going to be talking to us about the, the behavioural side of things and uh, uh, the, the, the whole uh, area of public goods uh, versus private goods. So I'm really looking forward to your presentation. So maybe if you could share your, your screen with us and uh, we get your, your uh, presentation underway. And just while you're doing that, just remind everybody that you can ask uh, questions of uh, Michelle uh, at the end of the, the presentation, uh, but use the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. And also today's uh, webinar is being recorded and the presentation, a copy of the presentation will be available on the Chagas website uh, after today. Uh, if you go to the Chagas YouTube channel, you'll see a full playlist of all of the previous uh, signpost webinar programs uh, there for, for, for you to view at any stage. So Michelle, we will hand over to you and uh, we will talk to you in a few moments then uh, in about half an hour's time. Okay, thanks, Mark. Um, I hope everyone can hear me. Um, so this morning, what I want to do is um, broaden out the discussion in relation to um, catchment management and, 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 and water quality in general, and link up what's, what's going on on the ground with farmers, with what's coming out on the excellent and the science side of things. And so um, a brief outline of what we're going to be talking about this morning, a, a brief introduction of setting the scene, if you like, where we are in relation to water quality. And then I want to, to describe different types of goods and, and where water quality fits in um, from an economist's point of view, how we, how we define different types of goods. Um, we look at public goods, um, agri-environmental public goods, um, the difficulties that they are, there are in, in providing public goods and even defining pu public goods and possible sol solutions and some conclusions at the end. Um, but first, I want to point out that um, this nexus between the production, uh, agricultural production and the environment, is, it's, there's nothing new in here. So here we have a, a quote from um, 1798 from an economist at the time called Thomas Malthus, um, where he, he sees that there are it's, it's this great difficulty, um, an insurmountable way to the perfectibility, to perfectibility of society to, to, to match these two, um, to provide food and to, to not destroy the environment, if you like. And in 2018, we're still writing about the same, the same process and the same challenges that farmers face. So first of all, credit where it's due. And um, since um, Thomas Malthus wrote this paper, um, agriculture has successfully produced food to feed a global population that has increased eightfold. And, and it's been done in two ways, basically, in the beginning. Um, we brought more land into production, more agricultural land into production. And in the last 50 years or so, we've seen um, productivity growth um, and efficiency. This is productivity is um, turning inputs into outputs. And we've become more efficient at how we do that um, through um, increased mechanization and um, fertilizer um, improvements and all of the, the way that we know um, farming is today. 
but also we'd like to highlight that um, in relation to the environment, agriculture has a very unique relationship. And so farmers have been aware of their environment, of, of the climate, of the weather for, for, for many, many generations, forever really, because the environment will determine what can be produced. It will determine when it can be produced and it will determine how much of it can be produced. And in the environment here, we're talking about all of the conditions, the, the weather conditions, the soil conditions, um, all of these things combined and farmers have been well aware of, of all of this for, for forever really. One of the things that we forget about agriculture is the huge success that agriculture in, in becoming so efficient. They've, they've released so much labour out into the, the wider society and so we've all become um, richer if you like and, and we've seen um, huge, huge success across the economy in general. So when it comes to water quality, um, I think it's a situation that we're all kind of aware of now. Um, we see uh, worsening water quality in our rivers and lakes. Um, we see um, a range of mitigation measures um, based on scientific um, research. They're often very context specific. They often need to be matched to exactly what's going on on the ground. Um, and, and farming practice and land management decisions are important um, for this very reason. And so understanding um, what, how it is, what it is that drives or motivates farmers to engage with these practices and these land management decisions is hugely important. Um, but of course, farmer decisions and farmer for farmer management and, and land management is only one part of the wider um, water quality. They, they, that has only, um, I'll revert to um, Per Eric's excellent presentation a couple of weeks ago, where there are multiple different stressors on water quality. And the behavior is one and farmer decisions and farmer um, land management decisions is just one part of a, of a wider thing. But if we, want to, um, if we want to address this and if we want to get a deeper understanding, we need a, a correct diagnosis of what is the problem? What is the problem when it comes to water quality? What is water quality and how might we, um, all of us together, and it will be a, you know, from, from different uh, disciplines, how can we um, uh, address the problem of water quality? So Europe has, has um, pointed the finger at Ireland as having particular problems, and, and this, is, this is one of the reasons. We seem to have a, a very high percentage of farms that have livestock production. Um, we're number one in Europe, and I suppose being number one in Europe is always, I don't know, is it good or is it bad? Or, um, anyway, we have, we have the highest percentage of farms in livestock with have livestock production of some type and um, within the European Union and of course this is this this is for historical reasons and climatic reasons and traditional reasons and loads of reasons around it but this is where we are so what can we do and very often and this is a phrase that has come into the public domain uh, recently public money for public goods and it sounds very simple and um, but what are public goods and and what public goods can agriculture provide and if we are going to provide these public goods with public money, how do we pay for them? So that's what I want. That's the discussion that I want to, to initiate this morning. And, and, and I think people will, will um, it's intuitive. A lot of this, a lot of the economics work is, is very intuitive. And so we can see our own behavior and we can identify with what's going on with a lot of these things. So in economics, we'll define goods and we have two benchmarks. So is it excludable? Can, if it's supplied, can I exclude everybody else from having it. Can I have an ownership over it? And rivalry, um, and it's, it's, it's a slightly complicated term, I think, rivalry, but it means that if I consume the good, then there's nothing left for you. So if it's an apple and I eat it, then it's gone. Um, if I eat it, you can't have the piece that I eat. So it's, it's, it's rivalry and consumption. It means that it's divisible and there's less for everybody else if somebody uses it. So the type of good that we have um, very often influence, influences how it's supplied. And so in the back of your mind, I'd like you to keep in mind all the time, we're talking about water quality. So how do I supply better water quality? How do I make decisions that will increase the supply of water quality and we're, we'll get to the how difficult this can be and how we might be able to address it. So we'll have some some we'll have a look at some different type uh, examples of these different types of goods. So we have the two different so we have rival and non-rival, we have excludable and non-excludable. 
And in this top um, left hand corner that I'm looking at, we have, we call the private goods. They're both rival and excludable. I can, if I own it, you can't own it. If I use it up, it's there's none of it left for you. And these are the goods that we're all used to. The markets exist for these goods. So we can buy them and sell them. So we have the usual things. So things like tractors, so things like handbags and food. And in here I've put land as well. So we can buy and sell land. So these are all private goods, markets exist and supply and the markets will determine and the, the, the laws of demand and supply will determine how it's supplied into the market. Then we have club goods. So club goods are excludable, but they're non-rival. And what does that mean? It means that I can join the club, so I pay a membership fee. So we're all used to the GAA or, um, uh, or golf clubs. We can join these clubs. We, but we can also have things like satellite TV, so we pay our membership fee. Or we can go to the cinema. Now, I know the cinema will be... Um, will be a smaller group but um, once you pay to go in um, you can go and watch the movie there's there's not a, there's no less of the movie for everybody else to watch just because I'm watching it all of these sort of things the problem exists in these goods and um, the problem here is the size of the club so it may not matter for GA because there are different people have different roles within the GA and I might just be a member to go and enjoy what's going on um, and similarly for satellite television, there's no, but if there, was, if there was a huge membership in a golf club and everybody wants to play at the same time. So how do we have, uh, how, do we, how do we match those sorts of things? The next ones that we look at are common goods. Um, so they're rival in that if they're used, they're gone, um, but I can't stop anybody else from using them. And so here we, we look at the fisheries and the sea and so, um, common fish stocks and you can see in that very, very first little photo it's a little bit small but you can um, in your own time blow it up you can see the huge decline in fish stocks over the last number of years overfishing um, and this is the problem with common goods they're overused um, and it's so it's a, it's a case of if nobody owns them um, nobody looks after them there's no ownership rights we can all use them so they get over exploited and here, the, the big problem here, it's called the tragedy of the commons. And so there's a huge lit literature out there about the tragedy of the commons, but the one we can think of mostly is the fisheries. And that brings us on to the public goods. So I can't stop people from using it if it's supplied and me using it doesn't leave any less for anybody else to use. And so in, in the traditional public goods, we think of things like street lighting. We think of things like lighthouses um, and so the way to think of this is if street lighting is provided, so if there's the lights outside my house and the street outside my house, it's available for everyone. The light is available for everyone, but the public good that's, a, that a, that's attached to street lighting is a sense of security. It's not the light, it's not the light post, it's not the bulbs, it's a sense of security. And likewise, bridges and infrastructure or roads are, um, they, they all have a public good that it makes it easier for people to get around or, um, and the lighthouse, again, we're back to a sense of security and um, providing safety for people and make people feel more for, feel better if, if, if they have these goods. So typically these goods are undersupplied by individuals um, and because of, so let's look at, when it comes to water, water can fit in every one of these boxes in some shape or form, all our water. And so the first one we've the tap. So if you're paying for your water, and I, th I think many people in rural Ireland will, will, will already be paying for their, for their water and um, group schemes or, or private wells or whatever. Um, and so that's a public, that's a private good. We pay for it. And um, if I use it, there's less for everyone else. On the club goods, we have things like water sports or being a member of a club that's going out on um, a canoeing club here. But we, you can think of any other clubs, fishing clubs, boating clubs, and um, you have to be a member. Um, and then we have the, the, the common goods, the fishing. Um, how do we regulate that? And, you know, the, can, is there, you know, catch and return policies in place or whatever it is, but we can see the fishery. And then we come to the public good that's involved with water, and that's the water quality. So if the water quality is good, um, the public good that's here is, is public health. So um, I think we're in the middle of a, a, of a global pandemic and we're hearing an awful lot about public health that we hadn't in, in previous times. And we can see how difficult um, 
getting everybody to work together to provide at the public good that is public health will it, it's a difficult it's a difficult thing so it's it's across all of these what we see and in economics we call them property rights so the, there's a whole spread spectrum and there's a whole range of possibility of different consumption possibilities and ownership rights and property rights so public goods what exactly is the problem with public goods and why are they so difficult so in economics we would say that they're a type of market failure so we've no we don't have a market that's going to regulate the supply of these we've no price we've no quantities we've no shops that we can go into and buy them and very often we're trying to measure and economists love to measure things we're very often we're trying to measure things that are difficult to measure so how do you measure a sense of security that's attached to having street lighting in, in, in villages and towns around the country and so we require very often different methods and different techniques and different technologies um, and we use survey methods and we can calculate people's willingness to pay for things or people's willingness to accept um, things like is, what is your willingness to accept um, a lesser quality water, for example, but these are these are kind of the, typically the, the methods that we use. And public goods very often provide an economic rationale for governments. It's what governments do. So um, for the typical public goods, like the street lighting or the, or the, the lighthouses or infrastructure, roads, all of those are things, we all pay our taxes and then the government provides them. The, the thing that, that, that public goods, the, th the problem that's most associated with public goods is they create a problem called a free rider problem. Now, what is a free rider problem? So it's the situation that if the, the individuals are able to consume a good without having to pay for it. Um, and I'd say we're probably all free riders in some way or other, wherever. This is part of human nature. It's part of, it's part of what we do. And we do it without even thinking about it. The flip side of it is the chump problem. And no one wants to be the one that's providing all these goods and, and getting no reward for it. So um, you don't want to provide them. But um, and, and not get paid for them. And because of these different, um, different problems, because of this free rider problem, specifically with public goods, they're very often under provided or sometimes not provided at all. Um, so for agri-environmental public goods, so this is, this is starting to come into, um, people are starting to talk about the agri-environmental side of public goods for the last number of years. And what exactly are they? So I, I'm going to call them public goods plus. Um, so we have two types of market failure. We have the market failure that's associated with the public good element, that's the excludability and the rivalry side, and we also have these externalities. So externalities are unintended consequences on third parties, so you can think of things like pollution is the, the bad externalities, or good, they can have good externalities, so you can think of provisions that the bees provide in making their honey, they also provide, um, you know, they, they pollinate um, so we have that good externality that we don't see. And sometimes we can have these are mixed, we don't even see. And, and I know you're all wondering what, what this photograph is. Um, this photograph, I think, um, it captures a lot of what's going on here and, and unintended consequences or externalities. This is a photograph of um, flooding in Pakistan in 2010 severe flooding and the water was st stagnant water stayed for a long time and and people thought that there was going to be an increase in malaria because stagnant water is a breeding ground for mosquitoes um, and there was this 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 fear that malaria was going to spike but the spiders went into the trees and they ate all the mosquitoes and there wasn't a spike in 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 the malaria that they saw in, in this area in this time and so it's kind of these unintended consequences um, um, and i think this this picture in particular kind of highlights those things also i think when we talk about um environmental public goods one of the things that we'll think about is biodiversity um, and biodiversity sometimes we think of the nice things that we want in biodiversity but we don't think of all of the the public good provision by the the if you like the things of the biodiversity um the elements of biodiversity that we may not like we might not, we might not like spiders um but, but when, we, when we see things like this, you can see the public good provision that, that is attached to this type of biodiversity and, and why it's so important. So across agriculture, there's a whole range of public goods or public benefits or goods is probably a bad word, but it's a whole lot of things that people benefit from um, because of agriculture. So the farmland biodiversity, and it'll, it'll bring up um, 
we become more resilient the more biodiversity that we have in our farms um, water quality and water availability are, will pr provide public goods and um, the soil quality is soil quality a public good is how fertile our, our, our land is is that the public good land itself is not a public good um, land is, is, a, is a private good, but is the soil quality, can, could we look at that as a public good and, and how, how land and soil, how that functions? Climate stability, it, the land and, and agriculture provide um, carbon storage and, and, help, and we can help in reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so we provide that public good and public health and public safety. Um, rural vitality, so having farms and having agriculture in, in a rural area provide um, vi Pro pro provide an, an additional, um, I suppose, uh, element to rural life and um, vitality. Is that a public good? And, and how, how can we see that? What does that mean? What is that public good that's, a, that's attached to, to the, the rural areas? Food security and not food provision, but food security that we will can we can see and, and sustainable food security, I suppose, is probably the bigger one. How can we ensure that we are provide food um, into the future. And our landscapes, the landscapes, our Irish landscapes are so, so synonymous with them, um, you know, tourism and, and beautiful places and scenic locations. But we have to remember that all of these landscapes are man-made. Um, I have a picture here of all the beautiful stone walls somewhere in the, in the west of Ireland. So these are man-made um, 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 landscapes. Um, but it's very difficult for farmers to capture the public good element of that, that, those lovely landscapes. And so sometimes the solutions that we have to provide these things. So we'll, we're thinking again of from the economic side, um, the, the economics for the traditional public goods like the public lighting and, and bridges and so forth. Um, taxes are subsidies. So we'll pay our taxes and the government will provide them. Um, things like donations. So um, things like Wikipedia that will look for, for a donation towards the services that they're providing. Um, some people will, some people won't. Um, the thing is, will they get enough people doing the right thing? And so that's something that we're, we're used to hearing lately with the, the COVID crisis. Will we get enough people that will do the right thing, that will give um, public goods to for provide this public benefit for everybody else? And um, we can make these private goods uh, we can make the public goods, I, sh I should say, we can make them private. So we provide the roads, we build the roads, we put in the infrastructure, and then we put on a toll. Then, those, then there's the altru altruistic uh, solutions, so social norms um, and peer pressure. Um, it's, it's not, it's, it's not it, none of us are entitled to, to uh, cause pollution. So I can't dump all my rubbish in my front lawn. There's social norms around this sort of behavior. And, you know, um, how do we, how can we, how might we tap into social norms in relation to other things? Social sanctions, so in punishment, we hate um, from the behavioral side of economics, it'll say that we hate losses more than we love gains. And um, this is true of negative and positive. So you may have heard, you know, that for every negative comment, you need to give um, three positive ones to outweigh the, the, the damage that that one, and I, I suppose we can all relate to that. Um, someone says something nasty, we'll remember that for a lot longer than someone says something complimentary to us. So, and voluntary organizations, so things like tidy towns, and um, I'll have to put my hand up here and say, I'm a total free rider on the tidy towns committee in my own local town here, who do great work all summer and put up their baskets and flower baskets and keep them watered and make the place look lovely. And, um, and I say, isn't it lovely, but I don't help out in any way at all to my um, shame. Um, and then from the environment, agri-environmental side, we have the ag agri-environmental schemes. And agri-environmental schemes can be fantastic in providing some of these goods um, and not so good in others. And, and um, I think for water quality, particularly difficult because, you know, the water is moving. Um, it, it's not affecting everybody in the same way. Um, in different farms, it'll be, uh, there'll be different reasons why the water quality is not so good. Um, and, and there's a whole, a whole load of other things. Some of the very, and we're, we're, we're used to now these agri-environmental schemes. Um, so we've started back, people will remember the old reps. Um, and, and then we went on to, um, now we have the glass. And when we look at glass, you can think of one of the parts of the glass scheme is um, that they, 
that farmers will get paid for their stone walls. And of course, this is very context specific and location specific. There aren't stone walls in the whole country, but there are in some places. So these sort of solutions, they're, they're not quick, easy solutions and they need a lot of, um, we need to think about them and we need to implement them. Of course, all of these, um, the, the, the agri-environmental schemes that we know of that have been very successful have been very targeted. So we think of the Burn Life Project, hugely successful agri-environmental scheme, totally targeted at the specific area and the specific conditions that are there and, and the bright scheme down, down in the south. So these sort of, this is where agri-environmental schemes are moving. So now we're talking about the public money side. So we're going to spend public money. This is our taxes and we're going to spend, spend them on these schemes. But where does this public money and where do these environmental schemes fit in at present? And where are we going in the future? So this is a graph that shows um, kind of the, the, the track of the cap over, over many years. And so you can see back in when there was only 12 countries part of Europe and we had um, market supports. And then we moved into the couple direct payments. So people may remember, you know, there are suckler, suckler premiums and um, 10 month schemes and all of those um, coupled payments back in the 90s. Um, and then we see we moved into 2005, we moved into direct payments and all along on the top. And so these, all of these payments are what were called pillar one. So this money came directly from Europe um, and, it was, and it was divided up um, accordingly. Um, and on the top, you can see the piece, um, the rural, it's called the rural development piece. So these are the pillar two payments that come from Europe and they're co-funded by our government. And, and the agricultural and the, the agri-environmental schemes, I should say, come out of this, this portion of the, the money from Europe. And at, at present, I think they make up maybe 25% of that co-funded pot of money. So you can see it's, it's not a huge amount um, and, and over the lifetime, we have now we have 28 countries trying to divide up a smaller pot of money, if you like. Um, and so where are we going in the future with all of these things? So for um, the proposals for the next round of the cap, we can see for the first time these eco schemes are now going into pillar one. So we, all of the details around this need to come out yet. And um, as they say with these proposals, nothing is agreed until everything is agreed. But you can see the direction that the cap has been moving over a number of years and, and trying to incorporate more environmental um, 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 aspects as we've gone along from, from back in the 70s and 80s when no one mentioned environment at all to eco schemes being mentioned in under pillar one of the, of the, the payments for proposed payments for, for in, into the future. So just want to, this is very, just a very quick slide. So from the behavioral economics literature, we say that there's a number of different rules when we want to, um, when we want to get people to, or, or influence how people behave and things that we just need to keep in mind. We, we hate losses more than we love gains. We like certainty more than uncertainty. So we like what's now and what we know rather than what's in the future. And the further in the future it is, the more we dislike it or the more we can, the less that we can, um, um, understand it or, or know what it is. Um, we view economic losses or gains in context. So there's no point saying to me, um, it'll cost this. So we, we need a context in, in relation to what or where does it fit in? Or is that good? Is it bad? What's the value here? Um, an endowment, we overestimate our chances of success. Um, so there's an endowment effect and there's what they call an optimistic effect and we overestimate, maybe we do, maybe we don't. They're kind of funny ones. The thing I think we, ab we abhor anything that seems unfair. And I think this is hugely important when in public good provision, especially in, in, in something as complex as, as water quality. So why should I have to do stuff when, you know, um, my neighbor is, doesn't have to do it or when other people in society aren't doing it or where other sectors we'd feel are not pulling there, why should, it, why should it all come back on me? And so I would say that it's a real sign that we're dealing with a free rider problem and a public good problem if we can start finger pointing and what about the? So if questions are asked about what about the? And in the middle of this pandemic, we're talking, we're pointing fingers and what about this? And what about the house parties? And what about students? Or, you know, what about different things? We're dealing, it, 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 it points to the fact that what we're dealing with is a public good issue and we're dealing with a free rider problem. And these are not simple 
and easy steps. And so we don't, we should not be pointing fingers. What we should be doing is trying to all work together in these things, of course, but, and, and we're more motivated by stories and statistics. So probably people will remember more the picture of the spiders in the tree than a lot of other things that I've said this morning, but that's, that's good in itself. So, so a little bit of conclusions, public good provision is not easy. It's particularly difficult, I think, in relation to water quality, because there are many actors Many different, um, many different actors involved, not just the farming sector. Um, and the improvements may take time. So we won't see them. We might not know, are we making improvements that we won't, what we do now, there won't be anything um, straight away. So it's, it's this bit lag time. There's issues of fairness um, and, and farmer behavior and land management decisions are only one part. Um, and, and lots of other things like the climate or the soil type, all of these things all, all fit into this. And agri-environmental schemes can help, but they need to be targeted and context specific, which makes them more difficult. Um, and I'll just um, point everybody to other signpost seminars from the ACP. So Per Eric gave his one on the water quality and that's excellent. And looking at all the different um, aspects to water quality, not just on the scientific side, not just on, on the behavioural and, and, and farmer um, activity side. Um, and David Ryan gave an overview of all the equipment that we have and how we collect all our data. And, and, and Edward Burgess um, gave the, an assessment of how the agriculture catchments are going to be looking at the nitrates um, derogation, a new, a, new, um, a new act that we have to do in, in the, the new, new um, this cycle of the agriculture catchments programme. And so, thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you so much for that. That was really interesting um, and stimulating. Um, I suppose you, you've posed a lot of questions there as well, haven't you, Michelle, around the whole valuation of public goods? Because um, I'm particularly interested in how, how do we capture the value or how do we measure the value? I know you were saying that's the... The, 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 the focus of economists so often, but uh, how, how can we better capture the value of water quality and, uh, you know, get people to, to appreciate it and, uh, uh, and, and also, I suppose, attribute the, 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 the work that goes into protecting water quality back to the, the, the land managers in the country. Yeah, well, this this is the huge question. And, and it's not just about water quality. It's about all of these public goods. Like, you know, we, we can do we can do what, you know, we can use the techniques that we've always used and we can use the willingness to pay and we can do surveys and we can find out and we can we can make an estimate of, of what it is and how important it is to people. Um, we can't put a, a definitive figure on it because because of the of the complexity of the situation but but we can all but i think what we need to do if, if we can have the discussion around it and if we can highlight the, the if we can if we can diagnose the problem properly and, and understand where the problem it is because there's so many people now working in this space in the water quality space and everybody working together can bring bring it bring a different element or a different expertise or a different knowledge to it and if we keep in mind um the 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 intuitively what we know about and what we can see in the literature and what we know about adoption and about about behavior and if we can try and incorporate a lot of this very intuitive um, um i think i think people can relate to them. if we can if we can combine all of this stuff together but working in silos and and everybody working on their own little bit i don't think will will help and that's true of of most of of public good uh, provision through uh, agri the agri environment side of, of public goods the question here, Michelle, in relation to food security, uh, can you expand in the definition of food security as a public good and how food provision is different? So this is broadening it out to I suppose, the overall overall uh, outputs from agriculture. I think that's a yeah, um, really, really well, good question. Well, public good provision in, in terms of food security, food, food, the, the production of food is a public, is not a public good. It's, it's a private good. We buy it and sell it. But public good the public good in relation to the security that we have about of knowing that we will we'll have good that we will be able to produce uh, food into the future is a public good because it's we're talking about um we're talking about security we're talking about you know is there going to be food for our children down the line um, are they going to be able to sustain themselves are we going to see climate crisis becoming so so bad that there are only going to be a certain amount of pockets around the world that's going to be able to produce food at all are we are we looking at those sort of scenarios so the public good is is the security it's kind of the um it's like it's like um 
it's like security is one word, but it's kind of the, the comfort maybe that we have or, or the safety net that we have that we know that, you know, that we're not leaving um, this world any worse for the generations that are coming after us and that they are going to be able to look after themselves as well. And the security issue, um, I, I just, I don't know, does that answer your question or not? Yeah, Mark? yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's good, good to separate the, the categories there. Just from your experience working with the catchments program, I mean, what sort of approaches have you seen that work in terms of of, of getting that that buy in? And uh, we talk about adoption uh, as being a major issue, not just for water quality, for climate change, and biodiversity. Just from yeah. your, your experience, your observation, I mean, from, but from from the data that we've collected and and we've surveyed farmers about um, different mitigation measures, we can kind of um, first of all the mitigation measures. Um, it doesn't make sense to just ask farmers in general about mitigation measures because very often these mitigation measures are very specific to what their farm needs so it, it may not be um, but in general I would say from a, a whole range of mitigation measures that we've asked farmers about and we've asked them about buffer zones and dredging and um, time in a fertilizer use I would say farmers in general seem to be in favor of the mitigation measures that are um, in around if I'd say the ones that that cost more in terms of their time than in terms of their pockets. So um, spending money on on different mitigation measures may not be top of their list, but they're they're very aware of the time that they put out their their fertilizer or spreading no fertilizer, spreading no fertilizer with high P concentrations in in. A, in going on their on their nutrient management plans. So if they can if they can change their behavior in terms of the time of where they put out their, their slurry and where they put it out and how they put it out, rather than um, 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 different mitigation measures that may have a high cost involved them. Farmers seem to be from the data that we've collected and what the data says, that seems to be their, their preference. Mm -hmm. um, but in saying that, um, we would need to, if, if if the scientists and, and, and if everybody else, and, and we can do this in the catchment program, we can match the mitigation measures to the problem on the ground. So if the problem on the ground needs buffer zones put in, then that's, it doesn't matter, you know, whether the farmer has a preference for it, that's the, the mitigation measure that's going to solve that particular problem. And I think one of the one of the benefits of the agricultural catchments program is that we're, we're so unique and we have such um, rich data in that we have access to actual work in farms and, and what's going on in the ground with farmers. So it's it, we can match these things and say um, on a broader and and, and it's the, the challenge then becomes to scale this up to to. Um, we can do it because we have such contact with our farmers, but to scale that up to a program or an agri-environmental program that's rolled out across the country becomes a little bit more difficult because all of these um, measures need to be, as we know, I think, targeted and specific to the context. Thanks, Michelle. Pat, uh, we've got some uh, yeah. very some, interesting some really good questions here. there. Uh, uh, Catherine Lascaretz is asking, uh, how can we move a public good from the free category uh, to one that is appreciated enough that it can be paid for, uh, 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 as if it, it, it does not get uh, remunerated in any way, it will not be provided. So I, I suppose it's the, it, it is the classic question, how do we, we get people to, to put in place these free, uh, our, um, um, uh, the free goods or, or public goods and, and have a way of, of being remunerated from them or for them? Yeah. Um, and, and this is an excellent question. And I'm so delighted that um, this person asked this question because that is exactly the discussion that I was hoping that this presentation would generate. How can we, these, the, the answers to these questions aren't there. And very often, you know, it's, it's dealing with them ourselves or, um, you know, we need to start thinking outside the box and we need to say, you know, what works here, or what works there um, and, and public good provision. Um, and so, Everyone will have a different idea. So I'll just give an example of um, um, when we're talking about public good provision. Um, there was an area where they wanted to put up um, um, a, a wind turbine. And we know there's a lot of, and in, in a very, um, in a town, in, in a very built up, not in a rural area, in a very built up area for a very specific purpose. And um, in that area, they went out and they, they canvassed every house that was within two and a half kilometers of that house, of that where they were going to build it. And they explained to people what they were going to do and why they were doing it and asked them for their support. 
the thing is they went to every single house and if you weren't there they went back so they they talked to every person so you can imagine the work that was involved in that the result of that was when that um, um when that that project went for planning there wasn't one objection to it because everyone had a buy-in so how do we get a buy-in we talk to people we ask them we say to them you know this is what we're doing and this is why we're doing it and can we have your support and because we all like to be asked we we like to be asked so um you know we can have all the science um, and we can know all the solutions and then we have to communicate it we have to explain it and we have to get buy-in from the people who are making the decisions so we can come up with all different things and and very often i think um speaking to farmers and and um, we say that you know we need to we need especially in water quality and so the question being asked really highlights how difficult a lot of this stuff is so um, especially in rela relation to water quality I mean farmers know every river and stream and every part of it that goes through their land they know um, but they also know that the, the that water and their stream has come downstream from somewhere else and it's going to flow down down the stream and there's all of these things so how do we um, and these are the big questions, and I'm afraid, I'm afraid, sorry, that there, there are no simple answers, but we can all have, we can all have an impact. Uh, there's just a, a question there in relation to uh, CAP and CAP reform, and, and just uh, alluding to the fact that the asks are getting so much bigger ver uh, very rapidly in terms of greenhouse gases, ammonia, water, biodiversity, and yet the pot of money is 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 is, is reducing. How do we go about, uh, I suppose, getting better value uh, through behavioural? Uh, uh, aspects of behavioural science uh, in terms of, of delivering the, the, this bigger ask? Yeah, it, it, they are bigger asks. And, you know, in, in thinking of this um, very often, um, especially we have, we, have, we have so many with the, with the ASAP advisors who are out and, and they can see what needs to be done. So maybe we need, maybe we need a, a pot of money that's provided there that say that the um, experts can go out, they can engage with the farmers. They say that this is, we can we look at the critical source areas. We'll point out the areas that need the most work first and that, th that those, those measures will be put in place. That we're not going to expect the farmer themselves to, to, to provide um, the money. Or, now, and of course, we're, we're on dodgy ground here because farmers already get paid in a lot of compliance and no one is entitled to, no one is entitled to, to, to pollute anything. But a lot of the times we're talking about diffuse pollution. So it's kind of, it's, it's, it's like by accident. So they're not doing it on purpose. So maybe if there are, if there are mitigation measures that we need, maybe we need to take back control um, from a government point of view. Maybe we do need to do that. Maybe we need to just provide those measures in the in the areas that the experts can link them to and put them in place, and then and then that the farmers will near would will kind of look after it from there on, if you if you like, instead of instead of throwing the throwing it back on individuals to say you need to do this. Does that make sense, to... Pat? Thank, thanks, Michelle. I, I have a question uh, coming through here for Pat actually. Uh, Pat, the question is here is what is the role of Chagas in promoting water protection measures and is Chagas still promoting land drainage, uh, which uh, this viewer claims is leading to a leading cause of pollution? Uh, perhaps, Pat, you could just comment on that. Yeah, I suppose they're, they're, it's, not, it's not quite that simple in terms of the, the, the last comment. Uh, uh, there's, there's positive and negative effects in, in, in terms of land drainage, but there's no question. I think if land drainage is done badly, it can lead to, to problems. And I think one of the things that you're trying to do is, is, is uh, make sure that it's done effectively and that it doesn't lead to uh, uh, pollution problems. Uh, the other aspect is in terms of what's, what, what's Chagas doing in terms of, of uh, water quality, uh, along with uh, uh, the dairy co-ops, we've put in place the ASAP service uh, and you'll, anybody who's been on these programs that would have seen Noel and a number of his colleagues on talking about it, where we're out in the priority areas for action, dealing with, with farmers, identifying the issues that are uh, leading to 
the specific water problems in specific catchments and working with then with farmers to, to, to alleviate those. And I, I would have to say, and, and back up a lot of what, what Michelle is saying, in terms of engaging with farmers and talking to them, uh, rather than kind of uh, uh, having broad messages, when you, you get down and start talking to farmers about the issues, there, there's, there is a, a, a very strong sense of responsibility among them, or amongst the vast majority of them, and a willingness to take on uh, a lot of the actions that are that they're being asked to do. And I suppose this is where uh, policy can have a role as well in that some of those actions which do take or which can take a significant uh, uh, cost uh, 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 need to have some element of support uh, associated with them as well to get them over the line. Uh, so, so there's that element of the service, but I think what you're also seeing is with the ASAP advisors there as kind of experts uh, in water quality and with the ACP behind them uh, uh, delivering a lot of science. We're actually moving to a point where we're spreading that right across the advisory service. So the increased capability and willingness of all advisors to deal with water quality as an issue is uh, gaining ground uh, uh, rapidly. Uh, and we're seeing uh, a lot of advisors engaging the ASAP, their ASAP colleagues and dealing with, with water quality issues themselves. Yeah. Of course, there's a lot of work going on the research side. We have the Agricultural Catchment Programme and a lot of initiatives around pesticides and water quality happening around the country as well. So I think it's fair to say that there is a lot happening there and uh, at, 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 at all levels within Chagask. Um, Michelle, uh, you've, you've, you've stirred up a, a lot of... Uh, uh, interest in this uh, public-private uh, uh, debate, and um, just have a question here. Um, it's, it's relating to um, it says there are many cases where reps interventions were put in place, uh, but then removed when the funding ceased. Uh, is there any potential for funding of public goods to, to be results-based uh, and to remain to, of value to landowners loaners after the funding scheme ceases? Uh, or to be funded in per, into perpetuity, per, per, perpetuity um, uh, to ensure their longevity. So this is a this is a, a real issue uh, for schemes, which are really when we look at it. I mean, a five year term is is a very very short period of time, and and we did see you know reps habitats um, falling out of the system and a lot of good work happening. You know, are there are there are there uh, measures or approaches there that uh, can be used to, to to have that long term support for these types of, of measures? Well, I think um, when you see the the scheme starting to move into pillar one, that's that's the that's a first. So so it's going to be there. Um, the devil will be in the detail, of course, and they're probably that those schemes will probably still be voluntary. Um, um, and, and it's probably it's a feature of, of environmental schemes down down the, down the years and very often um, traditionally or historically when we had the environmental schemes and of course everyone still wants to bring back reps for because the money was so good um, um, and, and very often these schemes were uh, were associated with West of Ireland as, and seen just as an income support rather than the environmental benefits that were attached to them. So we're, we're learning all the time and we're moving all the time. And um, um, and one of the things that, that farmers would say about um, these schemes, that they were sometimes they were difficult to get into. So Gloss was difficult to get into. The funding wasn't really secure for longer than. Um, so um, th those are th those are issues that are they're coming up all the time. Um, I'm not an expert on 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 all of the the agri environmental schemes down along, and the, but there's been a lot of research done on them, um, and but I think we're moving in the right direction. And and you know, like I said, when we if we go back to the 1990s when we had all those um, fantastic um, um, couple payments coming from Europe, there was no mention of environment nothing at all. And now we're getting to the stage where um, at least, and, and it, when it comes to policy, these things are always slow. Nothing is going to happen overnight. It's not going to be immediate, but, but, but you're right. This, the, the, these schemes that last for a couple of years and then end, this lack of security and this lack of um, 
is has always been an issue but if we see it moving into pillar one maybe that's maybe that's a first step to, towards that um the voluntary side of it it has been an issue at times and then because then are the farmers that we really want to target and the ones that really should be making the environmental improvements are they the ones that won't engage with the agri-environmental schemes if they're on a voluntary basis but these are all broader bigger issues um, um and, and and issues that you know people in that space are have been aware of and um, are, are, are moving all the time um, and, and farmers themselves are, are aware of it um, so um, yeah I think I think all of those issues Mark are all mm -hmm. highly relevant. Michelle there's a question here that if say the, the new cap with James to reduce fertilizers and pesticides or well it's not so much the new cap it's the green deal I suppose uh, is successful it's likely that food production will reduce in the EU and two likely outcomes are in, increased production in, in less regulated areas and increased uh, feed costs uh, 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 as a result uh, and just ask for a, a, a comment a general well i'll give a general comment because it's not my area of expertise really but um one of the things that we've seen over the last number of years is this is this um um low cost policy in relation to food so if we think back in very early days of the cap when when back when it was it had very specific aims and one of them was um, to provide cheap food for, for consumers, but also um, to provide incomes for farmers and to modernize farming. So they were the three big pillars in the, in the very early days of CAP. We've definitely modernized farming. We've definitely provided cheap food for people. And the third one is provide income for farmers. And um, it seems to be there's always a debate of, you know, why are we why are we subsidizing farmers? Well, it's because we have such cheap food policies. So maybe if maybe if there maybe if if the, if the laws of supply and demand and and um, food will become dearer if 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 supplies become tighter. Um, and that's that's a broader issue. Do you know? Um, it, it, it's it's kind of a big one, isn't it, Pat? Yeah. No, it, it, it is. Uh, and I suppose. Um, one of the, the potential issues there and one of the, the big challenges is to see can we over the next five to ten years reduce our level of inputs while not losing levels of production and, and uh, there's a huge amount of work uh, going on in that space and I think it's a, a, an area which with increased focus we can actually make uh, a, a lot of progress on. I mean, if you take for instance the, the work on, on clover with uh, nitrate, reduced nitrogen, uh, multi-species swords. There's there's optimism there that we can reduce uh, input levels and and not necessarily reduce uh, to any great extent the output. I think I think the point is well made though as well. Uh, you know, not just in terms of water quality, but in relation to uh, to carbon leakage. Uh, this is is an issue that we're acutely aware of. That the, you know the higher production standards in Europe uh, uh, can uh, lead to uh, uh, production, that, that, that supply shifting to, to areas in less regulated environments. So we just really have to be careful about these unintended consequences, uh, but obviously uh, sustainable, sustainability at the heart of, of it uh, for, for, the, for European agriculture. Um, we have uh, quite a, another few questions coming in here uh, in relation to uh, food uh, supply chains. Um, but just to, just to let people know that there, I mean, there's sort of a lot of information available on the Chagas website uh, in relation to water quality. Uh, very just simply Google Chagas uh, and, uh, and water quality, and it'll bring you to a lot of information around the ASA program. Uh, the work that's going on there in the catchments program, and also uh, the, the the work that's going on in terms of nutrient management, which is seen as one of the major tools uh, for addressing uh, uh, fertilizer management at a farm level. Uh, question here, uh, Michelle. It says the individual farmer is uh, the start of a long food production system. Are there tools in this type of approach for other economic actors to be involved, such as food processors and retailers? which may end up uh, benefiting directly from public goods. Um, so the ASA program we know is a joint industry program uh, with, with uh, the, the dairy sector. Um, so, I mean, are there other examples of this that you've come across? Uh, in your work? 
Um, other other actors and and um, in my conclusions, I you know farmers are only a part of. Of course, there are other actors and and there are other actors. I mean, rivers don't just flow, flow through um, farmland; they flow through towns, they flow through villages, they go into lakes, they go on. So there's a whole load of it. everyone along that 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 river river um, uh, network, if you like, are actors in in this. So everyone benefits. So of course, there are different. Um, and 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 people's capacity to 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 do it, but um, so and that's one of the things I'm saying. You know that this it, it is complicated. There are issues of fairness, um, and so everyone needs to pull their weight. Everyone needs, but we also need to make sure that we're not just saying it's all agriculture because it's not all agriculture. They play a role, but but processors do play a role. And they're and you're talking specifically in relation to the food chain. So if 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 farmers obviously have additional costs naturally um what we would think of always in in retail as if their costs go up then the cost of the consumer goes up mm. um but how do we capture that though if, if farmers have to have to if their costs go up in relation to provision of a public good who do they pass it on to mm. yeah yeah, yeah. A, a question asking for an opinion i think is is, is there asking uh does the lack of water charge undervalue uh, are in people's perception undervalue water in Ireland? Um, well, th that's a different issue altogether because that's we're talking about the private good part of water then. And um, uh, does it undervalue? Well, you know, the, we have so much water in, in Ireland that we kind of, we're always wondering why is it such a problem because we seem to have, you know, water everywhere and um, you know, there's days I look out my window here and there's streams running down the road even because there's so much rain. And so, you know, always when we have an excess of things, I think it becomes one of those things that we take for granted and we don't kind of, you know, wonder about it. But um, the pub, the, pr the private good element of water is, is a completely separate issue. Um, but I would say that most people in rural Ireland are, have, have, are used to paying for their water for a long time. Um, comment coming in here it's I suppose a general comment <laughs> in relation to water quality but just to, to say uh, interesting talk from Michelle lots of food for thought um, and this this person is saying that there should be no apology for animal agriculture it's what we're most suited to within the EU um, single biggest issue in water quality from this person's perspective is uh, the lack of adequate manure storage to allow farmyards uh, to uh, be liquid effluent free. And um, they're saying it's not intensity per se. Um, and finally, land drainage is essential to lower water table, uh, the water table to allow crops to grow optimally and to prevent denitrification and nutrient runoff. So um, just a general general comment there in relation to some of the- Yeah, and, and I'm not, I was just highlighting the fact that that's what Europe is saying is one of the biggest um, pressures on our water quality. The fact that we have such a large um, um, livestock sector. I'm not, I'm not saying anything about that. I mean, we have a huge tradition and, and huge historical connection with livestock production in Ireland and it's going back for generations and mm -hmm. generations and um, part of, because it's part of where we are. and. Back in the 1600s, um, the Dutch were, were you know, um, wondering, at, wondering at Ireland was such a fantastic place for rearing cattle because we had grass the year round. And um, so it's always been part of who we are and what we've done. Um, I'm not saying, I'm not pointing fingers in any way. That's, that's not my, that's not my um, area really, so. Okay, um, we're, we're just coming up to, to half past 10 now. So, so uh, Michelle, I just want to say thank you very much for uh, really, a stimulating uh, presentation and no doubt we're going to hear lots more about this topic over the next uh, months and years with the, the discussions around cap and uh, results-based schemes and so forth so i uh, wish you well with your work on the catchments program and uh, we hope to have you back again maybe uh, in the new year for to, to talk more about uh, that, that, that aspect of, of the catchments program so thank you um, perfect Pat, Thanks, thank you very much Thanks, for your help uh, this morning. No um, and uh, again, to, to everybody, if you want to get a copy of the presentation from today, uh, you can go to the Chagas website and you'll find a, a recording of the, uh, the, uh, the webinar as well. So next week, uh, we'll be talking to Dr. Phil Jordan from Ulster University. 
who's going to be talking about MCPA herbicide, uh, new insights from catchment scale research on the Northwest, in the Northwest. So um, um, Professor Phil Jordan actually will be, will be uh, giving us some insights into the work he's been doing uh, and also a, a former member of the agricultural catchments team as well. So I look forward to, to uh, Phil's presentation next week. So with that, I want to thank all of our uh, team, our production team, Andy Boland and Yvonne Maher and all of our partners. And, and thank you for uh, staying with us during these uh, strange times. And uh, we do hope you're enjoying the, the webinars. And uh, we do encourage you to fill out our survey at the end if there are topics of interest that you'd like to see featured on the, the series. So with that, thank you very Mark, much. Mark, should I just make a, a, a comment? Of course you can, yes. Something we, we talked about doing is, is uh, maybe if people want to think about it uh, over the next week, that we might just leave the Q&A open for five or 10 minutes after the session next week, uh, just to let people give us some feedback uh, just after the session uh, uh, and maybe areas that they think we could do things better or areas that we could cover. So just that pe the, the people who are on might think about it if uh, at some stage during the week, if there are things that they would like to see covered. And yeah. so we leave the Q&A open for an extra few minutes after the se session next week. Yeah, yeah. Well, do you know what? Why don't we do that now, Pat? And we'll just... Uh... Okay. We will, we will just uh, leave this, uh, the session open for a little while. So if you have any particular comments that you'd like to make uh, in relation to the, the general program, uh, please uh, just submit them through the Q&A and we'd be delighted to get your feedback. Okay, we'll leave it at that. Thanks everybody.